good. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a properly noticed uh, meeting, joint meeting of the Authority and Canal Audit Committee. Uh, my name is Eugene Nicandri. I'm chairman of the audit committee for the two uh, entities. I'd like to welcome other members of the committee, <coughs> Chairman uh, Kamel, uh, Trustees Pacenti and Trainer. Trustee McGibbon is excused for today's meeting. I'd like to welcome uh, President Pionis and the other members of his staff who are also present. This meeting is noticed uh, appropriately under the Open Meetings Law of the State of New York. And I would call the meeting to order. And the first item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Ask whether any of the committee members have any amendments or changes to the proposed agenda. If not, I'd ask for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. So. Uh, we're going to go into executive session briefly, and I'd ask for a motion under the um, 105F of the New York Public Officers Law for the uh, regarding the financial history of a particular corporation. So uh, moved. moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries, and we'll resume shortly. We're in executive session. <clears throat> We're back live. I'd ask for a motion to resume the meeting in open session. So moved. So moved. Second. Moved. Seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I would report that no votes were taken in executive session. Next item is the consent agenda. Uh, consists today primarily of the approval of the minutes of the December 2018 meeting. I'd ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Carried. Discussion agenda, Lee. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm going to take a few minutes to go over our audited uh, 2018 financials. The main takeaway that I'd like to leave you with here today is that MIPA remains in a strong financial position and our net income for the year 2018 was 102 million. Uh, this is consistent with some preliminary numbers that I had shared with the full board uh, in the January board meeting. Uh, so let me dive into a few of the numbers. I'm not sure if um, folks have the uh, presentation titled Financial Report Summary. Whether you do or you don't, I'll point you to the appropriate pages within uh, our audited financials. Uh, in the MDNA section on page 3, I'll be speaking to a summary of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position. Uh, for the year end of December 31st, 2018, the authority had net income of $102 million compared to $119 million prior year. Uh, this $17 million decrease in net income is associated primarily with operating income, the lower operating income of $16 million, and uh, net lower, uh, pardon me, pardon, net lower non-operating income of $1 million. The operating income decrease of $16 million uh, compared to last year is associated with lower margin on sales of $97 million, uh, which was offset uh, in 2018 by the absence of a $73 million impairment loss that, in, that occurred in 2017 associated with certain generation equipment and a long-term service contract that we entered into with one of our commercial partners. <laughs> operating, <clears throat> uh, further detailing operating income, uh, revenues were higher by $116 million compared to last year, uh, primarily due to higher market-based energy sales resulting from marginally higher hydro production and pass through of higher purchase power costs. Uh, O&M was effectively flat year over year and our net position was effectively flat year over year. Uh, the five million dollar negative change was attributable to a 102 million dollar positive net income and it was offset by the adopt by a charge related to the adoption of GASB statement number 75 associated with post-employment benefits uh, other than pensions resulting in a $107 million non-cash adjustment to the beginning net position in 2018. I don't think there's anything new there, right? You, sure. that's, we've heard all of that for... Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. This was this was um, raised during at this time during last year's audit meeting and um, it was a it was it was a mandatory adoption and one that we had prepared for. Yep. 
But I mean, operationally, everything, nothing else came out of the audit that we haven't already uh, talked about, right? That is correct. Okay. That is correct. <clears throat> I will touch on a few items on page five of our MDNA associated with consolidated statements of net position. What page? Uh, it's page five of the MDNA and page three of the of the PowerPoint presentation if you have that in front of you. The authority ended 2018 with a net position of $4.7 billion and total assets of $8.9 billion. Current assets were $1.4 billion and they decreased by $146 million uh, associated with drawdowns of investments uh, for to service debt and the timing of other payments and receipts. Our capital assets were effectively flat. Uh, they did increase by $77 million compared to last year, uh, and this is a result of continuing investments in our core generating and transmission business uh, and upgrades that were undertaken in order to maintain uh, the safety and reliability of our system. Our current liabilities were just over a billion dollars. They increased by $67 million compared to last year, and this was due to um, an increase in uh, debt maturities that rolled from long-term into short-term. I'll conclude there on our statements of net position. I'd also like to cover with you our capital structure and debt ratings, which are on page 9 of the MDNA or page 4 of the PowerPoint. Quick question on page seven, uh, Lee, as long as you're flipping through. Yes. So what's projected there is capital for Canal Corp, uh, the 215 million? Yes. Is that a function of historic plans? Uh, has, isn't indicative of anything that's been discussed in terms of reimagining canals? So this is, this is, <clears throat> um, this is, directly from the approved budget that was presented to the board in 2019. It's indicative of a steady state operation and does not reflect any capital expenditures for um, strategy changes okay. or reimagining. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, page nine, you're on. No. Glad, glad to answer the questions, and, and please, if, if <coughs> you have questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion of my, uh, of my prepared remarks. So on page nine of the MDNA, talking about our capital structure and our debt ratings, we continue to maintain a strong financial position, and this is something that we consider a strategic asset here at the authority uh, that enables us to um, assure that we have the financial resources necessary to achieve our goals and objectives. Uh, during 2018, uh, or at the end of 2018, our total capitalization is $5.4 billion, which does not include $500 million, $590 million of short-term debt and current maturities of long-term debt. Our long-term credit rating uh, continues to be uh, a, a, one of the highest in the industry. Uh, we're rated AA. That was recently affirmed by the rating agencies as, 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 soon, as recently ago as this past January. I'd like to conclude my remarks there on our 2018 financial performance and the financial statements. I, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have on these numbers or any other aspect of the statement. Uh, my editorial would be, um, and, uh, ignoring my uh, background and propensity to uh, read this kind of stuff, um, it's a great summary of the business of the business and uh, it's a great recap for all of us as board members that provides historical perspective, uh, some context for how we have gotten to where we are uh, on a variety of issues, uh, et cetera. So um, you don't need to read the, the full enchilada, but um, in terms of the business of the business, I'd encourage everyone to uh, give it a look uh, in some you know, time ahead. It's a great uh, point of reference, so kudos to uh, you guys for continuing to update and recap. And at some point with the assorted moving targets and transactions that we have, uh, I think it's uh, good food for uh, you know, topics in terms of 
continuing the dialogue as a board in terms of the monies and the yep. flows of monies that are due to us and where we're at in transactions and what we're responsible for and all the rest of that just to yep. in, ensure we're current since and, and you're significant right. dollars are moving and whether it's HTP or FTCP, I mean, all I mean, there's just a lot of money's coming and going, and it'd be good if uh, we just ensure we stay on informationally uh, current with yeah. all of that. We'll do, and and as you have noticed in our budget that you approved in <clears throat> December, uh, NIPA really is poised to be significantly increasing our capital investments mm -hmm. over the next you know, four years, we typically, our run rate for capital is 400, 450 million. And, you know, it's going to be 700 plus pretty soon. And if we're fortunate enough to get additional projects from uh, competitive processes with the New York ISO, et cetera, uh, that can very easily go close to a billion dollar a year in capital investments. And so uh, we will we will let you know that those are significant, you know, flows coming soon. Absolutely. We had some uh, outstanding MOUs with the, the uh, budget office. Are those, are we square on all of those uh, with uh, the state? I believe so. I it's believe the asset so. transfer. Yeah, yeah, the temporary yeah. asset transfer. That's, yeah. That's, um, I think it, there's a payment plan yeah. uh, <clears throat> and it's being complied with. with yeah. yeah. That's correct. I'll, I'll affirm that. Absolutely. Just takes us longer to get around the square from time to time. But, you know. <laughs> exactly. There's right and left turns there, right? So, but, okay, that. Okay. Yeah, well done. Thanks, Lee. Good. Thank you. Uh, Todd? Oh, we need a motion to uh, recommend the. So moved. Second. All in favor of a motion to recommendation that we approve the 2018 financial year end statement presented by <coughs> Mr. Garza here this morning. Aye. 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 Motion carried. Todd. Okay. Thank you. So what we've got here is uh, our summary of our audit results for the year end uh, 2018 financial statements. Um, I'm starting on slide one of our presentation. If you've got that in front of you. At this point in time, we are substantially complete with our audit. Uh, we, there were no significant changes to our audit plan or audit strategy that we presented back to you in the fall. We're in a position to issue an unqualified audit opinion on the financial statements and an unqualified opinion on internal controls over financial reporting, as well as an unqualified report over investment and compliance, so three clean reports that we will issue once the financial statements approved are after this meeting. Our opinion on the financial statements does include an emphasis of matter paragraph uh, related to the authority's adoption of GASB 75 in the current year, um, but that emphasis of matter paragraph does not modify our opinion in any way. It just calls the reader's attention uh, to that fact within the financial statements that that adoption did occur in the current year since it was a significant accounting standard that was adopted during the current year. Uh, moving on to slide two, uh, we have a dashboard of our audit results here for you. Starting in the upper left-hand corner, you can see here the significant risks that we identified in connection with our audit. This is consistent, again, with the audit plan that we presented back to you in the fall. We had one significant risk that related to the fraud risk over management override of controls. This significant risk is not unique to the power authority. This is consistent with all of our audit clients. This is pervasive across all of our clients. Uh, in connection with um, taking a look and auditing this significant risk, we didn't have any matters to report to the committee, and I'll go through that later on in the presentation. In the upper right-hand corner, we have a summary of uncorrected audit misstatements. We did not have any uncorrected or corrected audit misstatements in connection with our audit for the current year. Moving on to the lower. Literally, literally we, I found nothing. Nothing that was that raised to the level of um, needing to be reported to the committee. Right. Great. 
In the lower left-hand corner, uh, we did not identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control either. Uh, moving on to the lower right-hand corner, this is our uh, graphical um, uh, depiction of, of how we view uh, risks related to management's judgments and estimates and preparing the financial statements. Uh, estimates that are used in preparing the financial statements include significant management judgment, and so obviously these are the areas that we focus on significantly in our audit. Uh, in taking a look at those, those judgments and estimates in the current year, that being over asset retirement obligation, derivative instrument valuations, mm -hmm. pension, and other post-retirement obligations and investments. Uh, we noted that those estimates and judgments utilized by management were consistent with those used in the prior periods, uh, and we found those judgments and estimates used by management to be reasonable in the current year. Uh, moving on, the next slide, slides three through six, detail out um, our required communication to the audit committee. There's nothing significant to report in any of these items, and I'll just highlight several of these that I haven't already discussed. So on slide three, significant accounting policies and practices are disclosed in footnote two to the financial statements. We have reviewed those accounting policies, and we find those accounting policies to be appropriate. On slide four, we've highlighted here again the new accounting pronouncement, that being GASB 75, that was adopted in the current year by the authority. We took a close look at GASB 75, the adoption of that. We included uh, actuarial valuation specialists in connection with our audit to take a look at the actuarially determined OPEB liability that was recorded by the authority, and we didn't have any issues with the, um, the liability that was recorded. We also involved a GASB 75 disclosure specialist who looked at specifically how um, the GASB 75 adoption was disclosed within the financial statements and accounted for in the financial statements. Um, and again, we had no findings with how that was adopted in the current period. Uh, moving on, uh, there were no significant unusual transactions uh, noted during the year that we, that we were required to take a look at. On slide six, we did not identify any illegal acts or fraud in connection with our audit. We didn't identify any non-compliance with laws and regulations. We didn't have any significant difficulties encountered during our audit. And we didn't have any disagreements with management or any scope limitations placed upon us by management. <clears throat> Moving on to slide seven, again, this is a summary here of the significant risk that we identified in planning, that being the fraud risk over management override of controls. We've listed out here the approach that we have taken, the procedures that we have performed, both from an internal controls perspective as well as a substantive perspective. Uh, we looked at the uh, design and implementation of controls and the operating effectiveness over manual journal entries, post-closing entries, um, and found those controls to be operating effectively. And we did test a um, sample of those journal entries with high-risk uh, criteria. And we also looked at uh, revenue cutoff and looked at journal entries booked related to significant estimates and judgments of management and didn't identify any um, inappropriate journal entries within those areas. Uh, slides 8, 9, and 10, and 11 detail out our procedures over the significant accounting estimates applied by management. The first one on slide 8 is asset retirement obligations. Uh, this is an estimate applied by management. However, in the current year, uh, there were no significant changes to the asset retirement obligations that were recorded in the financial statements. There was no triggering events that required the authority to take a look at those asset retirement obligations that have historically been recorded on the assets um, of the authority. On slide nine, list out the procedures we performed related to the valuation of derivative instruments. Obviously, the valuation of derivative instruments requires estimates. We took a look at that, involved specialists in, in, uh, in connection with our audit, and didn't have any findings. Slide 10 lists out the procedures performed over pension and other post-retirement obligations. Again, uh, this relates to the GASB 75 adoption that I noted previously. And then <coughs> on slide 11, we've also listed out here the procedures performed over investments. Um, obviously, the valuation of investments also requires estimates and judgments for management, and again, we didn't have any findings related to that. Slide 12 
lists out uh, other significant areas where there's less significant less judgment and estimate applied by management, but their significant effort required from our perspective in terms of just the timing and the size of the account balance, revenue recognition, and long-term debt, uh, and the procedures we've performed there. Uh, moving on to slide 14, uh, not specifically related to the 2018 audit, but just something I wanted to highlight to the committee related to upcoming accounting standards. As we mentioned, in the current year, there was a significant adoption of GASB 75, and so I wanted to highlight what's coming down the pike related to 2019 and 2020. You can see here uh, the first one being GASB 84 adoption. Um, you will see in the current year there are new statements within the financial statements related to fiduciary activities of the authority, that being uh, related to the fact that your OPEB assets are in a trust, and those assets have then been recorded as fiduciary activities in those statements. GASB 84, which is, adopt, which is effective for you next year, will require that all assets you put into a trust be included within that fiduciary statement. So you're most of the way there to adopting that statement already. Uh, GASB 87, which will be effective for you in 2020, will be a significant effort for the authority in terms of adopting the new leasing standard. That new leasing standard will require you to put all operating leases on your balance sheet as you have capital leases, and so it'll be a blow-up of your balance sheet on a go-forward basis. Um, so I think that that will be a significant effort <coughs> in implementing that. Uh, it's very early days. The implementation guidance related to that standard was just released last week. Uh, and so um, does that include right of ways and, and that's the things? question there's a lot of questions specifically related to right of ways I do believe that they will be included in there um, as well as power purchase agreements are specifically scoped out but um, transmission lines transmission agreements those types of things will all need to be analyzed to take a look at whether they are should be put on your balance sheet as as uh, as operating. The premise leases. they're eliminating the distinction between capital and operating leases, and a lease is a lease, and we're going to recognize the obligation on the balance sheet. That's right, right of use asset. And, uh, <coughs> so that can impact our fixed cost coverage ratio. That's right. So okay. So yep. if I can make two comments as it relates to this, this is something that the rate that we're already transparent with the rating agencies on. Sure. No, I get it. it doesn't change the economics or yep. anything. It's just okay. yeah. So you have to put a value on. All of these things. That's right. Yep. And this is this state. This GASB standard follows the FASB standard. So the public companies you will see will be adopting this in 2019, in Q1 2019. So all public companies will be putting these leases on their balance sheets Q1 2019. Uh, and so you you have you know an extra year to put it on to for you to get leases. Have always been fertile ground for accounting rule makers. You know, they just <laughs> never give up. They just keep going back to the well of the old standards. You know. Yeah. FAS 13, I remember that was <laughs> created all kinds of consternation in its time. So. Yeah. so the good news is the final three that I have listed on here, GASB 88, 89, um, are really related to disclosures only, um, so won't have a significant <coughs> impact on you, and GASB 90. Um, so we really won't need footnotes of financials because everything will be up there, right? So you just look at your balance sheet and you're all set, that's it. <laughs> that's Nothing right. will be disclosed anymore, right? All obligations <laughs> are... Uh, Reflected. And that's all I had for my prepared remarks for the committee, but I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. And what's 88 uh, disclosures related to debt, including director borrowings? Joe, are we going to be able to borrow? Is that, we're we're going to leverage the. No, we're going to be able to leverage the authority's borrowing capacity here? I mean, we have a new program coming in, or what is that? Not, not that I'm aware of. Oh, okay. Sorry, Joe. All right. You got so excited. Yeah, I was so uh, jeepers. Hi, right, this is well timed. I like it. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything else. Anything? Uh, no votes required. Uh, nope. I mean, no. Yeah, in terms of the audit. Audit. No. Yep. Okay. Appreciate your efforts. Thank you for your uh, five years of uh, quality service, Todd. Yes, Todd. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, what you're going to do without NIPA, but I'm sure you'll, I'm sure, I'm sure you'll get along. Uh, Separation anxiety. Uh, you know, it's hard to, you know, <laughs> say goodbye. But it is. Uh, it absolutely is. It's been a, it's been a good ride. Uh, for sure. And we appreciate your help and counsel, and uh, uh, we're better for it. So thank you very much. Thank you.
and your staff as well. I appreciate that. I'm leaving you in good hands, though. Grace will continue, and, and Scott, obviously, he's been here before, so and he's, he knows the industry well. So, okay. Super. Look forward to working <clears throat> with you guys. Grace is steady hand on the wheel. So that's, that's right. Good, that's good to know. <laughs> Angela? Uh, good morning. I'm happy to be here to uh, give you an update on our 2019 audit plan status. So if you turn to the slide, slide four for me, if you turn to the slide... Turn to the slide that uh, says 2019 audit plan status. That's the, yep. the first slide there. So we have 50 audits on our plan for NIPA and canals now. Uh, as an update to the to the slide you received, we ha now have issued three audit reports. To date, six are in the final stages of reporting. They're expected to go out by the end of the quarter. Uh, two audits are in field work. Um, they're ending field work shortly, should be their reports will be going out the first week in April. Uh, then we have four remaining in field work right now. Two are ongoing and two are in the midst of field work. And now we also have three that are in planning for Q2. Um, I mentioned there was a high risk uh, observation, which has moved to a medium rated observation because we, we were able to get some more evidence that had downgraded that issue. And uh, management has addressed uh, action plans for uh, all the observations that we've come up in that audit. Um, so that's where, you are, where we are today on the 2019 plan. So you're on track? We're, I mean, on, we're on track. You feel good about where you are? Yeah, we're... Um, er, early, three months in, but you're in good place. Yes, we're making really good progress. Okay. Um, so the next slide really is just the change that we had one change where we um, added an audit on our... Every year we do third-party contract compliance, and we don't know which vendors we're going to do, but then once we do our analysis, we split... <coughs> we split that audit into two audits, so that, that was the additional add to get to 50. So if we go to the next slide. Is This is our update on audit remediation status for NIPA. So as of March 22nd, which is an update to your slide, we now have three 2019, 26, 2018, and two 2017 open recommendations, uh, which are to, due to close by the end of the quarter. So... Uh, we are making good progress with that and getting those 2017 open recommendations closed. So I don't need to go into my monologue on, no. on open <laughs> items no. from 2017? Yeah. No. We, we, and then on the canal side, which is the next slide, we have four 2018 and three uh, recommendations on the 2017 side that are also expected. Those will be closing a little later. They'll um, be closing by July 31st. but. Well aware that management is well aware. I'm circled track. with my question marks. So I was prepared to go into monologue oh, okay. mode here, but you're, assuring, you're assuring me I don't need to. No, we're on track. We're making good progress. On track, making good progress. Yeah. Okay. We are. Okay. Uh, the next slide is just the percentage of breakdown of where our remediation is today. Uh, and slide nine here is really the details of where those two, 2017 recommendations are related to customer credit on the NIPA side and then canals, permit management, and physical asset verification on the canal side. But as I said, we are tracking to close on time. Um, the, on slide 10, this is uh, a topic around audit cycle coverage. I know I presented to you in December what our audit cycle would be. It would be a five-year cycle, and depending on how many entities we had, was like 237 altogether between night bank canals. Um, there was a, a I know some a comment you made is how are we going to cover all our high entities within the five year cycle? So to re in response to that, we've come up with a new um, product which is called the Quick Impact Review uh, to cover the those 46 high entities. Um, 20 of those entities are on our plan this year. And for canals, they only have nine high entities of six of which we are covering. So I'm not, we will get the coverage for, for canals. So what's a QIR? A, a QIR really is a focus, short and focused review, taking a look at a high, a high process that really drives the business of a business unit. Um, it will really get a sense of looking at the control environment of that business unit, taking a look at business objectives, policy procedures, personnel changes, fraud, potential fraud or safety, IT, all these general categories we'll be getting information on. That will help us get, get us to covering some more of those high entities. Right now, as I said, we had 20 on our plan this year, 26 are remaining. We did an evaluation of those 26. Seven are eligible for QIR this year. The remaining 19 
are not really ready for audit because either they're a they're a new initiative, there's uh, the business is doing their own assessment of their process, or new implementation is going is underway and will will change process. Um, they've already been covered on another audit recently, or they may be in advisory engagement, or will hit our 2020 plan. So the the way we're going to execute those QIRs is through a very detailed questionnaire <coughs> walkthrough of the process that we select to review. We will be looking at key controls and testing for design effectiveness, not operating effectiveness, but the, the design should be able to mitigate the risk with a test sample of one. So this, the time period for getting a QI, a quick impact done is around two weeks. Um, it'll follow very much our planning field work phases and reporting phases that we have for our audits today on a scaled out version so we can get it done within a two week period. Um, the results will we'll have a real good sense of what that general control environment is. We'll have a good sense of how the designer controls are. We will provide a memo with the results of that uh, QIR giving a conclusion on what the design of the controls are, whether they're effective, partially effective or ineffective which could potentially, if in, you, we find ineffective design, could lead to a full audit down the road. Um, and then we'll you know, present this to management, we'll discuss the, the memo, uh, issue it like we normally issue um, our reports, and then we'll track those observations. Um, right now, if in Q1, we have one in pilot, we're actually doing one right now for a, to, um, within Q1, and the rest of the other six we'll be doing throughout Q2 through Q4 looking feed from feedback to management to say, you know, how the QIR went, where we could tweak it. I don't know if you have any questions related. This all goes back to our limited scope yes. discussion. Yes, and, this is right, an answer to right. that. So we don't lose sight of the forest for the trees. We're just marching down the path and Correct. Uh, others. So, and part of this is just being flexible and being nimble over the course of the year so you can uh, uh, interact or pursue or explore uh, particular areas that either are problematic or a high volume of activity, or unexpected, unusual, all the rest of that. Correct. So, right? if, if we need to jump in, we could do something, a quick impact review if we had to. Okay, great. So, um, so the next slide, slide 12, is really an update on our transformation priorities. So um, for branding, we've actually sent a survey out to EMC and their direct reports to get in their feedback on their view of internal audit. Uh, we've had already views from our internal staff, but that was done in in 2018. We're going to do it again because we have more staff now um, to get a real holistic view of what our, our team believes our brand refresh should be. Um, and then we've already created a timeline for that brand refresh, which we're expecting to roll out by in July. So there's, we have a marketing agency and everything for no, this? No, we have corporate oh, communications oh, to help oh, us to do just, this. They're really great at uh, doing this. You buy commercial time on uh, <laughs> like it, you know? If Super I could get Bowl. it. <laughs> um, so in terms of delivery on the Agile methodology side, we held a departmental Agile training uh, to give everyone in the department the feel for what Agile is and the concepts and how to apply it on audits. We've applied it on two audits this quarter. Um, the teams were very engaged, learned the concepts, applied it, were successful and very motivated. So we were, to keep that motivation going, originally we had eight audits that we were going to do Agile on, but we've decided to, we more than doubled it, we're going to, to do 17 instead. It's about 40% of our plan. Uh, with the goal of really being fully agile by 2020. Originally in December when I presented the roadmap, we had said 2021, but we believe that we can get it done by next year and our whole plan really be, will be in the agile way. So we're making really good progress there as well. Um, so GRC automation, uh, we're, we're ramping up for this. Uh, so the last several weeks we spent time with a, a consultant to put design requirements together. Risk management has also been doing theirs with their finalized uh, fi at a point now where we can start um, configuration. I know uh, RSA Archer has been here at night, but helping IT get the, the environment together so we can start configuration. They're, they'll be putting a implementation roadmap together for, for us. Um, so the go live is targeted for 1231. We're real, um, we'll be really busy between Q2 and Q3 and getting config, doing the configuration and then testing. So this is this will be a, a this is a big initiative for us this year. Um, in terms of data analytics, 
So for the 2019 audit plan, we've identified about 20 of the 42 NIPA projects will have some kind of analytics on it. Um, five of the 13 Q1 projects already have, we've already done analytics on. And uh, we, we are also working with IT to build repeatable scripts. We're preparing requirements right now. We have one script already that's been built to search for PII on share files, but scripts basically on pro, you know, pro cards, teeny, basic scripts of, that most audit shops usually do. We're in the midst of building those. And then on the training side for the analytics team, they've been getting Tableau training. Some of our auditors are actually using Tableau as visualization in their work papers. And the rest of the team will be getting advanced Excel training so they can do even more analytics on their audits. Super. Um, the next slide is really related to our quality assurance improvement program. So we've developed a quality assurance improvement program based on the Institute of Internal Auditors manual. We're in the process of doing our own self-assessment right now, and we'll have an external assessor come in later on in 2019 to take a look at to make sure that we comply with the IAA standards. We've already contracted with an external assessor from the IAA who is actually has a lot of experience doing assessments for utilities. So that um, individual will be here in July. We'll, we'll come out with a full report, which we'll present to you, and you can see how it will give us a real good indicator of how we are complying with the IAA standards. So I'm uh, looking forward to this report. Um, then on our innovation priority, so our innovation team has uh, created timesheets. We've been doing timesheets since January. <coughs> now we're at the point where they're starting to accumulate that data and, and report out what our timesheet data will be for the quarter. Then, so we can really see what budget to actual is. And it's the first time we'll, we'll get visibility into this. Um, and then, after also in the process of de developing monthly reporting, so we'll be taking a look at where we are budget to actual on every audit project. So this is this is making really good headway here as well. And lastly, on the talent side, so for training, uh, we have developed a training and development program, and it's really based on levels core, intermediate, and advanced. So our core level is really for auditors that are either new auditors, new to NIPA, have never taken these kind of trainings in their career, or have, haven't taken it while they've been here at NIPA. Basically, visiting sites for NIPA sites, getting tours of business units within White Plains here, getting utility training, training on communications, on technical auditing skills, IT, that's the basic level. Um, then intermediate level really adds on to that. It's really for the more seasoned auditor. It's for someone that's managing projects. They'll be getting more pr training on advanced training on communications, project management, risk-based risk, risk -based auditing, that type of training. And then the advanced level is really for those auditors that want to specialize in something. They say you have some auditors that want to specialize in cybersecurity or IT or accounting or regulations or some specific topic in utilities. That training is specific to that. It could involve maybe getting a certification. Um, so we're going to um, meet with HR to finalize that program. We'll be using it when we meet with our staff uh, on their individual development plans and to talk about any you know career aspirations that they may have. So, and that's what my update is for for now. Any questions of Angela? Any questions? No, terrific. Continue to make great progress. So okay. very well done, Angela. Okay. We've come a long way and over the last couple of years, so kudos for your up. leadership. Thank you. <clears throat> Subagna. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, uh, today I'll just go through a commodity risk management program and you know, uh, take any questions if you, uh, if you have. So um, just on slide two of my of my presentation, this is just to give you a flavor about our portfolio. 70% uh, of our portfolio is in, through bilateral contracts, uh, and then about 30% we of that we monetize in the open market, the wholesale market. So the graph below, as you can see, the uncertainty level is much higher for the merchant piece uh, compared to the bilateral. Um, and that's why we need to manage it very closely because the gross margin contribution of the merchant part of the portfolio is proportionately much higher than the bilateral uh, contracts mostly. Um, so, so going on to the uh, uh, next slide, 
Uh, so what are the sort of drivers of the risks? One is, of course, you know, we're 70% hydro, so hydro volume um, has a certain variability around it, uh, both in the long term as well as in the short term basis. And then the weather uh, is a factor that drives the price volatility, at least in the short term. And the customer load, uh, even though the bilateral contracts are fixed, uh, the customer loads vary that we have seen over, um, year, to, year to year. And then the increased renewables adoption. So, you know, as a company, we are preparing for it. Uh, we are making our assets more flexible so that they can be ramped up and ramped down quickly. Then we're putting sensors so that we can get that information out. But the fact is that the, with increased renewables, we will have more intermittency and more uh, <clears throat> uh, volatility in the, in the market. Um, so the merchant revenue, as I said, it, 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 it is a bigger part of our gross margin contribution. So you know, for uh, us to be able to manage our operate, operating expenses uh, and financial budget requirements, um, we need to be tracking that uh, appropriately. Um, the graph there is just an illustrative example of uh, how the hedging that we do just to manage the price risk, how that sort of you know tightens the spread around the, uh, the forward-looking view. Um, so we you know the hedging is primarily a price instrument that we, we, we manage the, the, the longer term uh, price volatility. Um, but then um, on the next slide, you can see how that uh, how that translates into uh, into real picture. Um, so, you know, the the first uh, it says 2019 November 12. The uh, th this graph basically there's an expected value uh, that we we calculate, and then these ranges of values both down and up based on the price volatility that we we put in the model and calculate this. So you can see the ranges, how the ranges have tightened between November 12 and March 14 because we put hedges in place. Um, and then uh, you can also see from 2020 through 2022 how that spread looks like because most part of the 20, uh, 2022 is unhedged and 2021 is unhedged. Um, what we are noticing, though, um, the on the long term basis, the price volatility is kind of shrinking a little bit um, because um, you know prices are declining <coughs> on, on an average basis, and then with the, dec the decline of power, the average volatility is also going down. So we are seeing that the risk is shifting mostly from the forward market to the sort of the short term market. So. Um, that's that's kind of our we're, we're watching uh, this pretty closely and our, our goal is to even address that through our ECRM system. So Bob, I can make sure I follow what you've got here. So <clears throat> you've said 30% of our revenues are merchant sales. Right. Right. So the graph on slide four here, what portion of the 30% is hedged? So this is just the merchant portfolio. So is this, it's 100% of the merchant it's sales? It's 100% of the merchant portfolio. Are hedged. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 not 100% of the merchant portfolio is not hedged. As we go closer to the prompt year to provide certainty to the budget, our volume, percentage volume hedged goes more and more. So, so we are watching over a long-term period. Now we can put trades in for three to four years in advance, but we don't, we don't, um, Put a lot of hedges in place uh, un until the prompt year. So the, we have a laddering strategy. So the laddering strategy is basically what we do is um, so over a four-year period, we look at uh, we track the price and we track uh, the forward curve and we uh, you know find counterparties if we can do the deal. But the 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 challenge with hedging is that once we lock in the prices. We will not be able to exploit the market movements should there be. Sure. So we walk, walk, watch You're eliminating it upside as well as downside. Exactly. I mean, so like, so yeah. we are very strategic about when and how to put the hedges. But the, as we get closer to the budget year, 
we want to be able to give more certainty to the yeah. budgeting process. So our volume has goes up significantly as we go close to the frontier. So what am I looking at? I mean, clarify what you're what you've graphed here, and I apologize. Um, so um, yes, uh, so the the band, the the if you see the um, the the stick, uh, the band that is the entire sort of the range of volatility of the value. So when the expected value is the 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 bold number, that's the expected value based on the prices today, our volume forecasts, and all that. So that's the budget value for 2019. Uh, the budget uh, was at 324. Yes, that's when we set the budget, that was the range we. So you narrowed that margin by hedging. Yes. As you got closer to budget time. Yes, and and as you can see. Uh, we actually captured more value than where the target is at by because we we manage the hedging program in a timely fashion. You know, Sarah's group. Um, um, well, that's right. I apologize. I'm not following. So, what is the target? Are you? I mean, so three twenty four. You're telling me the plan. So, in the plan for 2019 is 324 million of revenue. Right. That's that you have hedged. Gross margin. Yes. That you have hedged. Right. You've hedged the full 324. We have not hedged the full 24. A sub substantial percentage of it. Okay. Yeah. And so, thirty days later, you know, I mean, sixty, ninety days later, the impacts of your hedging initiatives. Yes, it's narrowed the uh, the okay. ranges around it. Okay. And it's also moved the expected value because we have been strategic in terms of our hedging. All right. And so, what are you telling us about twenty twenty one and twenty two? That's what I'm missing. So it's just to give you uh, an idea about the the uncertainty ranges going forward, you what you, what we've see, shown here is there's not a lot of hedges in place right now, but this is being tracked. So this is just the current picture so, to today of what those years are, but obviously we're going to buy hedges right. and, and shrink that those two going forward. Correct. Right? Exactly. Right. So, but to get out to 2022, so we have a our four-year plan includes 350 million of merchant sales revenue, gross right. margin, gross, gross margin. margin, gross margin on merchant yep. sales yep. revenue. And what are you quantifying in terms of the risk to say it could, uh, you know, best case be 484, worst case be, be two and a quarter? I mean, what so, are you doing to model that? I mean, what am I looking at? You're that's the the variation in the flow on hydro flows and all the rest of that you've modeled that under some set of assumptions right right so there is a there's a hydro flow forecast uh, and then there is also the price forward curve right. that we use and we model that so as you can see without a hedge position 2022 band is much higher than 2021 and because you know on the laddering strategy uh, the outer years our hedge percentage is very low and then, then, then we watch it closely. That should we get an opportunity, we will then go and hedge correctly. But the cost of hedging, as you get move closer, I mean, your your economic benefit there. You mean the the price rises, right? You're looking for right ins insurance in the near term, so as opposed to making the longer term bet. So we continue to evaluate that as well. Absolutely. That, that trade off, right? Exactly, exactly. So uh, the goal is to provide more certainty as we get closer to the budgeting season. Uh, but before that, we can watch and we can, you know, put opportunistic uh, hedges in place as, you know, um, market moves. And do we ever look, you know, use any kind of look back analysis in terms of if we didn't hedge anything? Yes. You know, look backwards and say what would hap what would have happened. Yes. You know, versus the cost of the hedge and all the rest of that. Uh, well, so the cost of hedge. Uh, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> in terms of opportunity cost of hedge, that mm -hmm. we know. Um, but you know, there's uh, many different ways of calculating the cost of trading. You know, which is the overhead and everything, the system cost. We we haven't gotten to that point yet. But we, in terms of opportunity cost lost, that we know. But in, so in terms of certainty, I get the benefit. So we've hedged to create certainty. But in terms of optimizing revenues, right. do we ever look back and say, well, if we hadn't, if we let market conditions drive outcomes, 
Um, what would the outcomes have been? You know, what's the price of wanting certainty? I mean, I'm just curious whether that's more of an intellectual exercise than it's worth or? It is certainly, we do back testing and stress testing of the models. <clears throat> uh, so we do back test to basically understand whether what we put in place was it effective or not on a, on a go forward basis. Mm -hmm. um, but what, so we, we know how much of opportunity cost, how, what is the opportunity cost of hazing. Uh, you know, then the, if we put a three year trade in place, let's say market move significantly up or <coughs> down, mm -hmm. then we, we have logged our, our prices at that point. Right. So we want to be very strategic about how, how much of volume we hedge on a long-term basis. So that's what we call the laddering strategy. It's mm -hmm. step uh, kind of thing. As we go closer to the prompt year, our volume hedged percentage keeps going up. But isn't it, I mean, to your point though, I see what you're saying, but insurance, this is hedging is a form of insurance yeah, and it only correct. exists yeah. because of uncertainty. And, yes. you know, I could look back over last year and say, well, I never had a fire in my house. Sure. I wish I hadn't bought yeah, that no. insurance. But at the time that you buy your insurance, you never know. And so I think what's you can see in that visual is uh, over time, you're tightening our band of certainty around what we want our market value to right. be. And so it looks like what we're doing is effective. That, that, is, that is very true. And uh, the chairman is also making a good point. We watch year over year to see whether we have hedged excessively or whether we have hedged right. less. You know, so that's with the ECRM tool, which I'll, I'll be talking about shortly, that is now enabling us to have that capability to really track it over year over year. Just to stay with your uh, analogy, so mm -hmm. um, I tell you, if, if you, you know, don't have a lot of fires, then you don't need, you, right. know, you can get away with a real high deductible. Yeah. So you want to protect against yeah. is right. the exactly. catastrophic. Yeah. Yeah. So right. we don't need to pay up yeah. right. for low deductible insurance. That's what I'm trying to get at here. How much are we paying? for precision versus uh, you know, some rele relevant level of, of market risk and exposure. And is the, is the cost uh, benefit of that? Yeah. Do we evaluate it? Do we measure it? How do we, uh, what are the trade-offs? I'm just curious as to what our process is. Uh, yeah, we will be working on that sort of thing. Now we don't have exactly all the ability. We've just put the CRM in place to be able to do that. So we are tracking it. I was talking about the forward market, the volatility, you know, the hedging is effective only when there's a huge volatility, because that's when you, your the insurance analogy right. will, will come in play. Right. We're seeing the forward market is, uh, you know, with the declining price, the volatility, average volatility is actually also declining. So to your point, you know, so whether we should go for 80% hedging or should we do 60% hedging, right. that's the analysis that right. we will be actually doing. That's a good, good question. And maybe next time, uh, you know, maybe there's another view that should come with this page four, which is if you show the actual hedges by volume, yep. right? Yep. Because if, if we have X amount of volume, then you can show the various ladders, you know, volume and length of hedges. So we could clearly see how much is left <coughs> on hedge yep. and how much is hedged per right. year, right. right? Right, absolutely. And this or hedging the highly volatile exposures where, you know, right. you know what, yes. and I'm not trying to say what it should be. I'll leave yeah. that to you guys. I'm just trying to understand That's how you question. evaluate that. It's a very good question. So just so that you know, I want to point to the, um, you know, there's a bottom part of the, um, uh, of the graph on, on phase four. So we go uh, to finance to get the uh, so absolute floor. Uh, what we can uh, we can manage with you know the in terms of the FCCR ratio and all that, so, so we manage the portfolio not to go below that. That's the absolute uh, thing where uh, you know um, we might have problems with the rating agencies. Mm -hmm. So so that we absolutely want to make sure that we we phased mm -hmm. out to manage to that level. Right. And then everything else is ab about opportunity maximization. Yeah, we've eliminated the downside risk at a right. certain point. And, right. Exactly. Okay. So the, my understanding this correctly, though, uh, is going f forward, these, these targets are our four or five year plan that we file every year. You're picking that as what our target is should be. Uh, in terms of financial performance, what so that he's calibrating? That yes. is correct. Okay. That is correct. 
That's what the 331, the 350, the 351 represent. Are. Yeah. That's yeah. correct. Uh, and, you know, um, if market conditions significantly change, we will revise uh, the four-year plan as well uh, going forward. So in the next page, uh, on the next slide, actually, it will answer your question, Judge. Um, so there's a governance process in place, you know, so we, um, uh, between f business service finance, risk, and our commercial operations, we sit together and say, okay, given where the market is, what should be the target? Uh, and we bring in operations also, uh, their outage schedules and all that, then we figure out what is a good gross margin target to have. Uh, so that's a discussion, uh, and then it gets approved by our ERMC, uh, the Executive Risk Management Committee. And then we, uh, in the risk management team, we track that target uh, achievement um, closely. Uh, of course, finance tracks it. Um, so that's how then we periodically report and update the RMC with regard to that, and we update the EMC as well if uh, you know uh, that is demanded. So I already talked about the multi-year strategy. Um, so we we want to make sure that we meet the FCCR requirement, and we want to make sure that we provide certainty to the budgeting process as we go closer to the budget uh, budget time. Any questions? Um, and just be very, very clear. We do not make any speculative. Right. Uh, right. Hedging. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so page six. Uh, so we are um, really, you know, with the uh, now we're getting the ability to uh, put a lot of analytics in place. We completed the phase one of the ECRM project. If you remember, we, you approved it in July of 2017. So the um, project, first phase of the project is completed uh, now. Uh, so we have got the forecasting, risk reporting, um, counterparty tracking, credit exposure, and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, transaction control is tracked and audited and all that. So th we are in the, um, at this time, we're deciding about the phase two, uh, the next phase implementation. This is going to give us the ability to um, uh, to manage the collateral, you know, because the forward trades uh, have the margining requirements. Um, <laughs> we will put the customer contract, the load, in the system, because we have also noticed load variability. And then, uh, as I was talking about, the, as the risk, the, the value is moving from the long term to the short term. The risk is also moving from the long term to the short term. So we will be we will be putting the physicals and day ahead and um, uh, real-time market uh, uh, data in there. And we'll also uh, develop the ability to do derivative hedge accounting um, in, in, the, in the system as well. Um, so fuel is also another part of the physical. So a trade has a financial leg and a physical leg. The physical is in the short term. The financial is in the long term. So you're going to have to have both. Gil was talking about, um, we don't do any speculative trade uh, by design, but we don't want to be caught on a net short position which can be deemed as uh, speculative, even though we don't have any intent of doing it because we put a trade in place, you know, let's say three years back, when we're realizing on the short term basis, we want to make sure that we uh, we are within our. Uh, so we don't find a position where we have to unwind any positions, or. So we we haven't done that actively in the past because we have been very conservative in terms of where at you know we leave a lot of room, uh, but that's something that we will be uh, looking at very closely uh, going forward. You know, given the market conditions shifting. Yeah, we should talk about our. I mean, back to Gil's point about. Next time around, I mean, to me, finance committee, whatever, there ought to be some yeah. sta regular reporting here yeah. in, in some way, shape, or form. So, you know, we have greater visibility. Yeah, I think uh, graphically, the, you know, the, the open positions. And yeah, the I think graphically, we should show you our entire volume. Yeah. And then show you of that entire volume how much is hedged. And Just make it part of some, you know, standard reporting yep. package so that we all have some, you know, better visibility sure. um, yeah. and awareness on our part as opposed to <clears throat> worst case someday finding you know a whole world upside down and yeah. you know, the markets moved and 
it's no. it, it's 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 so interesting now with more and more renewables into the system uh because i mean not now but it, if once we get very uh uh you know deeper penetration of renewables uh, it's the, yeah. the the characteristic of our portfolio is going to change Absolutely. dramatically. Sure. Absolutely, because they are you know they are basically bidding at marg zero marginal cost, right? Because exactly. they, they don't have fuel. Sun and wind is not no. so right yeah, now. The markets are designed for the marginal unit, which is natural gas unit. You know, so it's really the cost of natural gas drives the price in the market. Now, when you Put in a lot of renewables, and there's no natural gas. So the the, the what's the marginal price Absolutely. is? So a lot of policymakers and regulators have to consider that and change market rules. Big disruptors, right? Yeah, I big. Mean, so it's the, kind of the Amazon effect. Because yeah. our of power economy. our right. power plants will right. be more of a shock absorber, because the sun and the wind are not always there. A cloud cover or the wind dies down. Our power plants we have to ramp up or ramp down to. Right. To firm that power. And we want to get paid for those services. Mm -hmm. That's not how the market. markets work today. Right. So a, a lot will have to happen. But we are being prepared for that. We yeah. are doing the LEM and all that. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Any Thank you. Any questions of Sabagna? Thanks, Sabagna. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our uh, next audit committee meeting is on July 9th. Uh, uh, ask for a motion to close the audit committee meeting. So moved. Second. Favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Meeting adjourned.